Hey nerds, we are looking at the latest episode of X-Men 97, starting now. Welcome to the Nerd Social, I am Colin. And I'm David. Welcome back, David, from your hiatus. Thank you to Nathan for covering for you last week. The latest episode of X-Men 97, episode 7, which is titled Bright Eyes, Swordfully log line for this episode is that the X-Men find Sentinel inventor Bolivar Trask, realizing they've been played by a mastermind. David, what are your impressions of this latest episode of X-Men 97? I, I, I don't know what to expect in this episode, because even though we know what happened from the previous episodes, from the twists and surprises get revealed in this episode i was thinking like what just happened here and then how this happened which led me to more questions it did reveal a lot of things and i really enjoyed it especially there's a lot of cameos which is very cool yeah i agree with you in terms of the cameos we saw some of them in the previews but overall i think it was a very solid episode they were balancing a lot of different characters and it moved the story along I would say definitely a better episode than last week. I think last week's episode was a little bit of a drag, but this week it upped the ante a lot in terms of the storytelling. Having said all that, David, what would you rate seven episode seven? I would say give it a nine, which is a movie never act on. Okay. And I think I will also give it a nine because I like cameos a lot. Any other thoughts before we get into spoiler territory? Let's go for it. All right. So if you like our conversation about X-Men 97 and all of our other content, please like, share, and subscribe to this uh, page so that the algorithm can help us out. Okay, spoilers ahead. So we're going to take a look at the beginning of Episode 7, which shows Gambit's funeral here. And Nightcrawler really does speak very eloquently about how Gambit lived his life. And we saw several appearances from characters. I had to look up online who those characters are. I think there were some assassins and thieves from Gambit's past life. But noticeably, there was one character there that was missing. <laughs> and so, David, you can fill us in on which character was missing and what was your reaction to that? If all the viewers are wondering who those three characters are... Long story short, Gambit was part of a guild of assassins before he joined the X-Men. So those were his former comrades. And of course, all the X-Men were there except one, which is Rogue. Mm -hmm. thing. And everyone was like wondering what's going to happen next. And even Jubilee pointed out that Rogue loved Gambit. Like, and then Logan pointed out grief is a lonely battle. Yeah. But since Nightcrawler and Rogue both witnessed what happened back in Genosa... And especially seeing like, how Gambit died, mm -hmm. Rogue is beyond guilt. She went on a full rampage, which we'll see in the next yep, scene. Which is right here. So we can see this is part of the non-spoiler clip that Disney released the day before. Going through a secret military base, flying through in a very vengeful type of way to talk about Rogue's state of mind at this point. She's trying to find out where Bolivar Trask is and ends up finding General Thaddeus Ross. And either the voice actor is really good at emulating William Hurt or it was William Hurt before he passed away. It also confirms that the Hulk exists in this universe. What were your thoughts on the appearance of General Ross? Um, first of all, is it confirmed it is him? Yeah, this was is General Hulk? Ross. Yes, it was. It's General Ross. I'm talking about the voice. Is it oh, that? Ross? I'm not quite sure. I have to look up. I have to look it up. Um, to see if because that is the case. Don't, because don't forget, some act, some of the voice actors are not the original voices like Cyclops and Jean Grey, mm -hmm. for example. The original ones are either passed on or passed away, but they found people whose voices are quite similar right. to the original, which is amazing. So when we first see Ross, I was like, wait a minute, why does the voice look so familiar? So I was very surprised about that. But more to the point, that the Hulk is existing there, that even Ross saying to his soldiers, we're in a fortress where that the Hulk cannot barely through. But then Rogue came in like a crushing, like a can opener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so online it says that the voice is Michael Patrick McGill. So it's not 
William Hurt, but he did a very good William Hurt impression. I had to do a double take. Before the scene, there was a scene in which Cyclops and, Je and President Kelly was discussing the fallout of Genosha and how he would be portrayed politically, which is very interesting dialogue between Cyclops and Kelly. And then Cyclops deciding that the X-Men should go to Genosha to help out and be the humanitarians that they are. And we end up seeing that Beast was featured prominently in Genosha. Here is a, a shot of him with Amelia, which is one of Xavier's ex-flames. Ex From that episode, she ended up not uh, joining the X-Men, and uh, the X-Men became much more of an obsession for Charles Xavier. So she left him because of that. Did she end up being on X-Factor, or she just left doing her own thing and not trying to be a mutant. Yeah, David, can you fill in on that? She was part of the elite soldiers for Magneto when he created Asteroid M. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Then when one of his loyal subjects betrayed him, Amelia swore herself never to be in an obsession crusade ever again. She did with Xavier, she did with Magneto. Now she's going to do something for herself, hence what she's doing now. She's a doctor, technically. Exactly. So, yeah, it was a nice callback to the original series. I actually watched those two episodes just randomly, and then it came up, and I was like, oh, that's Amelia. And here we get to see the reporter. I think her name was Rigby, I think it was. Tilby. Tilby. And she had this budding relationship with Beast. And I think that Beast really was being a very big a-hole here at the end. But I, I think part of it is that he was trying to process his grief, but at the same time, she was trying to sympathize with him, but she was saying it in the wrong way. And it was just an awkward relationship, but I think that emotions and tensions are pretty high. And because of that, Beast was out of character. He also made a quote earlier about Mr. Rogers, which is really interesting in that you can see compassion, but you can also see anger. You can also see all sorts of emotional levels. Um, and then we switch back over to Rogue, and we find out that Rogue finds... Captain America, and we saw in some of the trailers that there was Captain America's shield. We was wondering who that was with Captain America, and it ended up being Rogue. And you can sense that there was some tension here, too. And I I don't know what you think, thought David, but I thought that there was going to be some uh, Avengers versus X-Men because he mentioned his team, and I was like, whoa, are they going to really bring the Avengers in here? Which would be really cool if they, if they did. Um, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because I, I, I read the comic book of X-Men vs. Avengers. This is somewhat similar, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point is, is that Captain America was looking for the same thing as the Rogue was looking for, which is Trask. And then they found his secret lab. They discussed the whole aftermath of Genosha, saying that Trask like, unleashed a war between mutants and humans and then what's the end game Captain America pointed out if I show up in my uniform it would send a message to them mm -hmm. and what we're excited to hear that Captain America would side with the mutants right but then she there realizes that Captain America is in a tight squeeze because he wants to help the X-Men but at the same time he wants to help people to serve justice he wants to be on the right side of both sides yeah when that's his weakness, basically. Yeah, pretty much. And then Rogue got a little upset that, that she even threw his shield out the field, literally. But then later on, she used Captain America's location and found Gyrick and absorbed all the knowledge to see if he knows where Trash would be. Mm -hmm. But then she got so angry that she caused some backlash at herself. Yeah. And her, knocked herself out. Yeah, and we see images of um, Nimrod. I don't know if, it, if it's another type of sentinel, but it was very scary to her looking at the future and figuring out mm -hmm. what that was. Um, we then go back into Genosha, we find out that they were more survivors, and we see that they were able to rescue Emma Frost from the rubble in Genosha in her white form. This is also straight out of the comics where you have the white form Emma Frost before. We've seen iterations of Emma Frost in relationship with Cyclops. So it's very interesting to see where she's going to go in subsequent seasons. Uh, to point out how Emma Frost was found, uh, Jean Grey was trying to psychically, psychically like, trying to find anyone that's still alive because the body may be damaged and mine is still intact. But during the time... Scott and Jean discussed about what's going on between them because it was so 
off balance mm -hmm. because so much time has happened since Jean was captured and then the time that Scott was married, supposedly, and then I realized it was Madeline Pryor. But when Jean Grey telepathically found Emma Frost, she also confirmed that Madeline Pryor did die mm -hmm. in the episode. So where the when Genosa was attacked, which made Scott upset and cried because he had a child with her. So mm -hmm. he's like he lost. So which led to this one here when Jubilee encouraged Roberto to come out to the, her family that he's a mutant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that here. It's almost him coming out of the closet to his family and. It seems as though it was going really well, but then there was a big twist here, gave it that I was like, yeah, they're trying to play it politically correct. Not the writers, but I'm saying that the mother is trying to play it politically correct. And it reminded me a lot of certain choices that people make in terms of the public eye. What was your reaction to that? I was like thinking, I was like, oh, okay, that's more than I expected that Roberto mom would accept him as a mutant but it turns out this is some sort of condition right but now that's confirmed that he's a mutant now they're trying to hide away that he's a mutant right and it turns out that her father is some businessman if they found out he's a child who's a mutant his value would go down and it also brings up a lot of questions as to how a lot of families still struggle with this in real life with certain lifestyles that type of family discussion even back 30 years ago in the 90s that was still very taboo to talk about but now we're definitely much more inclusive and expressive however of course there's more progress to be made but it was just interesting to see this type of interaction between parents and it was also addressed in x2 if i remember correctly with iceman same type of deal going on there Except Iceman's parents did not accept it. That's true. Yeah. And we get to see uh, reunites with the X-Men team. And this is a very good sibling moment between them two. And she commented how his bedside manner wasn't very good in terms of helping her process her grief. And this is also a very good thing that Marvel has done in, in terms of the Disney Plus series. I know that WandaVision did a very good job of, pro of, of talking about grief. And it led to a lot of different feelings, but also a lot of different real life discussions about how you process it. And I think that this is also a very good progression as well, where she's hiding it from the beginning of the of, of this episode, but now letting go in terms of all the different various emotions that she's going through and just breaking down at the, at the very end of the shot. And I think that they did a very beautiful job of going through all that type of emotion. Um, and we get to see the big bad villain of this first season. A lot of people online speculated that it was Bastion, and it is Bastion who ends up killing Gyrick here. Now, I know in the comic book world, you never know whether or not someone really dies or not, but it seems as though he's dead, I hope, because <laughs> mm -hmm. he's one of those characters that you like to detest, and he was one of the characters that killed Xavier. Then we get to see the prototype of the Prime Sentinel, so it looks like the beginnings of Nimrod and the future mm -hmm. Sentinels here. It's interesting to see the different types of Sentinel animation, the live action form um, of how they represent that. There's this, this goon squad, OZ, OZT, which we find out is Bastion's and they stand for Operation Zero Tolerance. David, do you know more about OZT from the comics? Yeah, OZT, uh, Operation Tolerance, was, was made by Bastion when, when he was first uh, made in the comic books. In case all the viewers are wondering, who is Bastion? Mm -hmm. Is basically the fusion of the first pro Sentinel prototype and Nimrod, which is the future version of the Sentinels in Days of Future's Past. And then there was an event going on that both technology fused together and then Bastion came out as some hybrid between of human and Sentinel. Not a mutant, just a, a technogenic hybrid. Mm. And he was raised by a human. He ended up seeing all this pre premonition memory and grows to hate mutants. Right. And then Bastion, when he came of age, he enacts the Operation Zero Tolerance. He's technically a, a sentinel the most evolved form of it right the best 
both worlds of past and future. Right. So that's like the 411 on Bash and those individuals that do not know this character. We see this shot of Rogue going rogue, basically dropping trash from a building. And the shock of it was really interesting. The reactions of the X-Men. Of course, Wolverine, this is what we all wanted to do. She's just trying to do the quiet part out loud. And Cyclops is just shocked. <laughs> but I don't think that he shed any tears uh, when the trash was dropped. But before there was a plot twist, we end up here Cyclops confronting and trying to save a lot of lives with Jean Grey. I mentioned before we recorded that Jean Grey really is not the damsel in distress in this oh. whole series. She has much more agency. She's almost like a co-leader. Before this shot, this is at Madripoor. They were trying to save people, um, working together to stop the building from collapsing. And it was really interesting how they interacted with each other in terms of their powers. So I really like that part where it's not about the fainting and the moaning of Jean Grey back in the original series. And you can see here, Trask did survive. This is the major plot twist. And turns into some sort of sentinel hybrid, like a more primitive form of Bastion. What was your reaction when you saw that Trask was not dead? I guess this would happen since they show the prototypes of the sen of the Sentinel Primes, but then he revealed to the X Men before this transformation that it was Sinister that put him up this. But I guess it was Bastion having more hand on it to turn his body into a more like a technoganic form, just like Bastion himself. But this is a more Mark One type in a way. Exactly. And also before that scene, I think that there was some interaction between Sinister and Bastion about how they were going to confront the X-Men. And Sinister was saying how you're rushing things and Bash is like, I'm playing the long game here. Because back in 1992, you've been trying to destroy these guys, but you weren't successful. So I'm here to finish the job. This scene right here, Cable reveals that he is Cyclops' son. And there's a little bit of a touching moment, but he kind of brushes through that. And David, you said something interesting about this interaction as compared to the original series, why don't you shed, shed, shed some light on that? In the original series, Cable did appear when the Apocalypse, Apocalypse attacked the X-Men and the human race. Cable appeared to, to prevent some occurrences during that fight so that his future can be changed, which unfortunately, it did not make a difference at all, mm -hmm. which made him think that there's something bigger happening. That's why he showed up. But during his interactions with the X-Men years ago, mm -hmm. people treated him like he's some stranger, especially Scott, because he's supposed to be the firm leader and everything, and he doesn't like Cable's attitude. But then when it was revealed that he is Scott's biological son, he felt, one, awkward, and two, what did I just did? And what did I treat my son? How come I didn't know this before? What can you expect? Scott barely met uh, Nathan when he was a baby, so he doesn't know how he will turn out to be as an adult. But then somehow the connection between Jean Grey and Mayan Pryor is still there. That's how he could connect it to Cable. Cable knows that it's not his own mother, but his mind does tell him the truth that he is Scott's son. We don't know how this reaction will be because we know what happened during Cable's future, especially Cable in the original series has a son himself, Tyler. Right, Tyler Summers, exactly. Which unfortunately died mm -hmm. in that. Which is another reason what may Cable go back to the to the past, and hopefully that his son will come back. Exactly. But now that he showed up and took and subdued Trash. He then revealed to the X Men that that he that Trash was wrong. That Mister Sinister was not a real big bad or mastermind ratter that does this whole thing. There's something worse. Right. And everything, even though he doesn't know. And then they tell him that you have to find this person, or else things gonna get much worse than Genosa. Exactly. Yeah. And so we find out at the very end of this episode that all this time, he has also a little secret. Not only that Magneto now knows that Xavier's alive, but Bastion has captured Magneto, and Magneto's alive. And we saw that Magneto from episode 5 was almost disintegrated, but I didn't buy it because I said to Nathan a couple of times that... There's no way because there's a dichotomy between Xavier and Magneto. If one of them dies, the story doesn't work. And so, lo and behold, he's alive. And this cliffhanger to figure out what's going to happen moving forward with this. And it's a very interesting plot twist in itself. David, what do you think of 
the return of Magneto here at the end of this episode. Um, uh, the first thing I would wonder is how did he not die? He was blasted. We saw how the Godzilla-like master mode, they killed all the mutants, but somehow did not kill Magneto. Yeah. So we saw how he killed the other ones, like, what's it called? The Morlocks, yeah. But now Magneto's not dead. The writers had to really had to explain how. Even McNeil's wondering how he not died from his reaction on his face. Sure, so, that's true. I did not even pick up on that. So uh, in a lot of ways, there's a lot more questions to be answered. And I think that there are definitely some things that they're going to reveal the next three episodes. Maybe they're not going to review <laughs> any of them. Uh, but it's been a very enjoyable ride so far. And it's a three-parter that's coming out. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up? One thing I just noticed, though, in the scene when the X-Men arrived to help the survivors, there were two cameos that people didn't mention. Mm -hmm. One strong guy. Yep. And two multiple man. Uh, okay. Yep. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. since we saw Forge hanging out with Storm, whatever they have, and, and we saw multiple men and strong guy in that scene, so it makes me wonder... Was Forge kicked out of X, X Factor mm -hmm. and work on their own, or there's something else going on? Mm -hmm. So that's one. And second, now that Cable's arrived, what's gonna, what's going to happen moving forward in the next episodes? Are they going to talk? Right. So I'm guessing that the next three episodes will have Storm returning mm -hmm. and Xavier returning, and then and there's going to be another twist. In, since we know that season two is coming, they're probably going to end it with a cliffhanger mm -hmm. or some big revelation coming up. Again. Maybe Apocalypse because we haven't seen Apocalypse yet. There's a hint, though. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe, just like you said earlier, they could be X-Men versus Avengers. Mm -hmm. But in the comic book, X-Men versus Avengers is related to the Phoenix, Phoenix Force. Force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... We don't know if it's going to be like that. Yeah. One other th cameo, Quicksilver showed up, but that was through Morph, unfortunately. So it wasn't like the yeah. real Quicksilver, but it was really interesting to see him in the X-Men universe. We've seen him in the past, of course, but it was nice to see him again there. That pretty much wraps up our thoughts on X-Men 97, Episode 7. We would like to hear what you have to say. Please like, share, and subscribe for more content like this, and we will see you in the next one. All right. Bye now.